second day of our conference. Um, because we are running out of time already, uh, I'll try to make it short. So, uh, we have in here a panel about um, uh, uh, Dogen and the art of living uh, philosophically. Because uh, some thinker thinks that enlightenment doesn't mean a miraculous or all the world the, uh, worldly experience, but simply an undistorted attitude towards reality that the adept is able to attend to pursuing the teaching, including a philosophical understanding of what reality is and how it works. Uh, so that's just one statement, and I'm pretty sure that. Uh, uh, by one way we have uh, one view about that and after we have uh, Raymond we have plenty of time because one person is uh, missing due to private matters uh, so uh, you have one hour one for you uh, we'll try to talk like oh, we speak slowly slow, and then we'll have a, a conversation after all together because this is also very important to share our ideas together so please enjoy the talk and I'll see you very soon. Thank you, thank you. Renu, would you like to say something at the beginning? Or no, no? no, it's okay. Okay, great. So I can speak slowly and everything is fine. Great. Okay. Um, yes, I will talk about Dogen, but I will also talk about Plato. And now the question is, you know, why would I put these two people together? Because we, of course, know that they are really, really very different. Uh, it's not that I will try to sweep under the carpet the fact that they have a very different metaphysics, which Plato has forms that are really how reality is carved, and uh, Dogen, of course, doesn't have that. There, is, there are just impermanent phenomena, and there is not, there, they don't manifest forms at all. Epistemology is also a way in which they are different because Plato well, at least aspires <coughs> at knowing the big network of forms which, will, which would um, empower us and make it possible for us not only to know how reality is but also to behave in, 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 in the real appropriate way according to how reality is carved. <coughs> Whereas for, for uh, no, Dogen, uh, knowledge is constant negotiation with, uh, with the situation at hand. But, okay, so it's not a question of compare and contrast. What I will do, I will also not look at the differences very much. Mm, my aim is really to appropriate some of the tools that these uh, two philosophers have and to, um, to see if, we can, if they have something to tell us. So constructive uh, dimension of philosophy, appropriation, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, the point is that I will look at how both they try to um, suggest that through philosophy we can transform our default aims. I will go into this what are our aims, like what are our, the aims that we have, like normally just by being human being, and how could we transform them in, a, in, a, in, a, in an intelligent way. Um, so let's say that by and large what they will do, they will say that we, we have to aim outside our body-mind. Whatever they think that we conventionally think we are, we will have to uh, strive towards opening up and, and uh, instead of having an arrow pointing, let's say, inside, we will need to uh, develop some kind of arrow, and I have this little arrow that will come back in the presentation, like outside of um, the conventional self. So striving to stay open to what is real, and yeah, of course, it will depend on what is real, but uh, open to what is real. And then also this idea of continuously and creatively behave according to what is real. So uh, we will see that according to none of them, it is, uh, you, you can just have found out what is real, and now you are open, and then you are done. So there is no way in which you are ever done. So there is this continuous uh, striving and continuous aiming uh, towards the outside. Okay, so the outline, right, of openness and creativity. Um, yes, uh, as the, the chair already suggested, we are talking about, let's say, transformative philosophy. So it's not a philosophy, uh, well, I claim that none of these two authors think that insight is enough, right? Um, and, and it's not enough for various reasons. One of the reasons is, well, inter interrelatedness and change. So everyday reality changes and we influence change. We will look at that. 
Um, so, well, because of that, we cannot just say, okay, we just understand it and then it's done. But also because we are, we as like human beings, we are always aiming. So we will have to look at what aiming is. And especially the, the, the main point will be to look at how we, how they advise us to reorient our aim towards what we don't possess and, and deem good. We will see that that is like our default aim. But now we will see how do we have to understand this openness towards what is real that they recommend. It will be something like as seeing what is real for what it is, not from what we think it is. So the real will be forms, will be dharmas, not uh, like a box full of nice objects that we might possess or some goals that we might achieve once and for all. And so what role do striving and creativity play once uh, we have reoriented our aim? So, that, so this is like the outline of what we, I will uh, look into. And we will see that indeed uh, the role of striving and creativity is to keep us aiming forever, to never think that our job is done because every situation is different. Okay, so why is it is right insight not enough and why is transformation possible and meaningful? Interrelatedness and change. So they have different metaphysics, different epistemology, but they both think, interestingly, that we are not independent individuals, we are not stable individuals, and we are capable of transformation. Okay, so this is, uh, according to Plato, well, you all know that according to Plato, um, well, everything is made of forms or ideas, we are also made of forms or ideas, but we manifest different forms and different ideas at different times in our lives because we are in time. Um, well, there was no time, but now there is suddenly time. So I will read you this very Buddhist sounding uh, quote from Plato, which is from the symposium. Uh, all quotes, well, except this one from the Sophist, the interweaving of forms, will be from the symposium today. Think of what we call the lifespan and identity of an individual creature. For example, a man is said to be the same individual from childhood until old age. The cells in his body are always changing, yet he's still called the same person, despite being perpetually reconstitu reconstituted. And then it goes on, talking about everything that changes in, in what we call an individual. And then it says, and not just his body either, Precisely the same happens with mental attributes. And then it goes about uh, character traits and about things that we know and then we forget and so on. So uh, whatever ha happens at the level of the forms, that they always stay the same, that justice is justice and that's it, we might, we don't just change because our cells change all the time, but we also, you know, can manifest justice today and not manifest it to tomorrow. So we are always, we are this, this shifting interweaving of forms. Dogen, that's probably for everybody of you more familiar um, terrain. So we are impermanent, we are a change in plurality of dharmas, part of dependent origination, interwoven with, with reality, so like the boundaries are just arbitrary and expressing Buddha nature. This quote, uh, that without constancy of grass, trees and forests is just the Buddha nature. And that without constancies of the body-mind of a human being is the Buddha nature itself. So whatever we call the outside or the inside is just this uh, without constancy, this you know, dependent origination and always changing. So if we are interrelated with the rest of reality and if we are changing, then insight is not enough and our transformation is possible and meaningful. I mean, if we are constantly connected with the rest of reality, Whatever we do will change reality, right? So it's not possible that we just behave as spectators because we are so embedded in reality. And the re the, for Plato, the everyday reality, and for Dogen, reality, is constantly changing. So what we put in it will, will cause a transformation. Okay. Um, so then, because so this is still the first part, because of interrelated and change, we have to express wisdom in behavior. And Logan also says in, in Vendova, uh, says if you, you know, if you just know a lot of things but you don't practice, you are just like a student of medicine who just forgot how to make a medicine but just knows all things by heart. Um, but now the important point is like, so what we, we should know that we are part of, of uh, dependent origination, some, in some translations called cause and effect, and we should not, uh, not obscure uh, causation, right? Uh, so we should not forget about that. There is all the discussion that I not, don't go into now about is, now the, is the in, uh, enlightened being outside of causation? 
Well, no, of course, I mean, there are all, all reasons in which he does not produce karma in a certain way, but it is absolutely embedded in reality. So our wisdom will be how to utilize cause and effect and create a tuned reality with our uh, open behavior. So um, we, if we respond unobstructedly to what happens now, then we are changing reality in, 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 in a tuned way. So this is the quote from Bouchot. It is the highest wisdom. It is uh, able to utilize cause and effect, and it is free in happiness and wisdom. In the five aggregates, it is like a gate opening. The moment of the present is a gate opening to affirm the Buddha nature as the miscellaneous circumstances manifest before us is to command the style of behavior which is free of hindrances. Um, so we will also go back to that, to that quote by Dogen. Also for Plato, we have this that wisdom expresses in behavior. So yes, if you if bad behavior means that you are ignorant about about uh, the forms that constitute reality. So if you behave in an unjust way, it's because you don't know justice. So yeah, first prescription: no forms, of course, you know justice. Um, but then also produce goodness. So that is what will happen next. But that's almost the reason why you should no goodness or justice, because then you can produce deeds that are according to that. We will also go back to this producing. Um, and, and this quote, I, I discussed this at length in a forthcoming article, but like uh, there is this moment like at the end of the ascent when uh, after being in dialogue with a good friend in a symposium, people uh, suddenly, or, or this, this lover, sees the form and then, only then it will be possible for him, seeing beauty in this case, as it should be seen, to produce not likenesses of goodness. So when, when one has seen goodness or virtue or whatever you want to call it, when you have seen it, you don't produce just images of it, but you can produce and you will produce the real thing. And then the question is, what is the real thing that you can produce once you have seen and you have known the idea, the form of of goodness or, or another virtue. So insight is not enough because of in interrelatedness and change, and we can express our wisdom in our behavior attuned to reality. So it is, it is, we need to do it because we are interrelated. We cannot just say, okay, I just watch. But also, I mean, it is possible to express our wisdom in, uh, in, in, uh, while behaving in a certain way in reality. So this was the interrelated and then change, let's say this is like one of the conditions because at the, at the end I want to say we can reorient our aim. So we can do that because we are interrelated, because reality changes, but now let's have a look at this aim, this aiming. Um, yes, so in our nature there is this always aiming and, and, and so that is, that is what makes it possible also to reorient our aiming. What is this aiming? What, what am I talking about? So aiming is like we are directed to something, right? It's like intentionality. We aim a camera or something at something out there. So that is part of our nature to be like directed outside. And we have intentions, we have desire. So this aiming of us is not uninterested. We are always aiming at the thing or a state of affair that we regard as good. Yes, with the weapon, we don't regard as good the thing in front of us, if it is a dangerous animal that I whatever. But the, the state of affairs of, you know, scaring it away, that's the, 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 what we regard as good. So we have a, an aboutness, an intentionality towards something, but we also have desires connected with it. We re, what we aim at is something we regard as good. And we are also prepared to make an effort. So aiming in situation in which we really want this is, is something that requires striving, requires concentration. So let's say this again. Uh, aiming, we could call it this directedness towards something or some state we don't possess. So it's kind of out there and we deem good and we are prepared to strive for. So. Uh, we need to see that for Plato and Dogen, aiming is both a default characteristic of the human being, but also a crucial in ingredient in leading the best human life, if properly oriented. So default characteristic of human being. Um, uh, eros, so aiming, eros is a kind of aiming at what we lack. Yes, so 
the symposium starts like what is what is exactly eros? Well, it's always oriented to what we lack. We deem beautiful and good, and we want to possess because that will lead to happiness. And at the end, everybody wants happiness. So that's some kind of there are some a, a series of redefinitions at the beginning of the speech of Socrates in the symposium. But they tend to say that we are always oriented through this striving, through, the, through this desire to what we lack, we deem is good and we want to possess for us because we, it will make us happy. And in Dogen, there is all this talk about uh, strivings. So uh, we, we, we are aiming at or we are attached to this and that. So these are like the entwined vines, the kato of human conditions. We are always striving. We are always attached to stuff. Okay, but uh, interestingly, for both this that you would say, well, this is something that you know always will also cause frustration and everything, actually is also a crucial ingredient for leading the best possible life. Because eros, so in 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 in, in the speech of Socrates, in, well, it's the, this, yes, in the speech of Socrates, uh, there are these constant redefinition of what eros uh, is, and then he says, you know, what you don't realize, but actually eros is always is always aiming at immortality, but we are mortal, so that's really really a problem. But actually, so when we see something, we want to possess something, someone who is beautiful, we actually want to make ourselves immortal. That's what we actually want. Usually what happens is that we look at a beautiful body and then we produce children. That's our way to gain immortal immortality. But he says this is really like for like common people. That's not us, absolutely not us. Much better is to produce poems and laws that are like images or goodness, but the best is bringing about manifestation of eternal virtues after philosophical dialogues. So instead of being attracted to a woman, we are talking about men, you are attracted to another man, you have philosophical dialogues with these people, at some point you really reach the knowing, you know, the understand the, the, the virtue, and then by under, when you understand the virtue, that the, the quote we just saw, when you understand the virtue, then you will not produce just images of that, you, just, you don't just write poems, but you will, will produce the real thing. And that will give you the best possible immortality. Because at that point, you will realize the virtue you have known. So when you produce deeds according to justice, if you have seen justice, you will realize, you will become immortal. Because justice is immortal, it's like it's an eternal form. Now you are manifesting something immortal with your behavior. You are manifesting temporally, of course, because you are a limited being. But in the city, let's say you are in Athens, right? You are in Athens and you now manifest justice after having known it. You, the immortality is the immortality of the form that can be, can be manifested in the city for a longer time. So this means that instead of trying to find out this immortality for yourself, your own silly genes, you know, you as an individual. The immortality you are looking for is the immortality of the form that you want to reproduce, you want to see happening in the mortal, in the temporal seat in which you are. So this is how you could reorient your aim and, and, and get towards using these arrows, but using in a way that is directed to the right things. And Dogen says Zazen is always striving to make a Buddha, and Zazen is invariably that striving which is itself making a Buddha, right? So it's, it's reorienting the aim in a certain way is what already actualizes what, what has always been the case, but it needed this, um, un, this reorientation in order to take place in the right way. Okay, so, but in order to, before we can reorient our aim, we need to have awareness of our aims. So what are we aiming at? What are our, our values or what karma uh, direct our, our aims? Okay, so for Plato, as I was saying, is awareness that we are aiming at possessing forever what we lack and deem as good. So that's forever is something that we have, we were not aware of at the beginning. And forever for humans means replacing what is old with something new. That's also the quote 
I, I read at the beginning, uh, the human never stays the same, right? It's just conventional that we talk about one person, but the way of continuing for human beings is replacing something old with something new, and it happens at the level of the cells, but also at the level of new individuals. And for Dogen, it's important, the importance of the awareness of our aim is we need to become aware of the specific karmic conditioning of our body-mind. And for that, think of all the times that Dogen uh, uh, suggests we encounter something which is radically different from us, like that we cannot know our walking if we don't know the mountains walking, that kind of idea. So we need to become aware of, of our karma and how to do that through the encounter with the other. Also, uh, we need to become aware of this important Buddhist principle that it's our aiming nature that makes the reality in which we live. So the things that exist are a function of our, our values. So in reality, there are, there is just pratitya uh, samutpada, there is just you know, a constant arising, dependent origination, there are no things. But because we desire, because we have certain aims, we start seeing things as things. We start seeing reality as things, things of interest. And that's really beautiful in this quote. Uh, it's the quote about the fox. Um, okay, for saying a fully cultivated person does not fall into causality, he was transformed into an anomalous spirit. He was not just an ordinary fox. On hearing a turning word that released him from the spell, the mountains and the rivers were suddenly transformed as confirmation of his new liberation. Right? So changing one karma changes even the mountains and the rivers. That's really beautiful. Okay, so we need awareness of our aims and our values because that creates realities in two different ways that we have seen. Now that we have the importance, like the possibility of change because we are interrelated and we, and we know about what aims are, we can look at what we wanted to look at from the beginning, that is the reorientation of our aim. So or reorientation of our aim goes, uh, in order to do that, we need to have openness to what is real, and that's the little uh, arrow I, I was talking about, right? So what we keep from our default nature is we keep aiming towards what we don't possess, what we deem good, and we are prepared to strive for. We don't ditch that. But for the first time now, we see what we don't possess and we deem good and we are prepared to strive for, as what it really is. So we don't see what we want and what, what we deem good as things of possessions or bodies that we want, but we see it as forms or we see it as dharmas. So carrying the self forward to verify in practice the myriad things is delusion, I think that it is delusion to, not just because your intention has like a fixed uh, goal, but also because your intention makes things. So if you say, I want to be open to see A, B, C, D, then you are creating A, B, C, D. You are, you are drawing boundaries around parts of reality. So in this case, you really see the myriad things as things. But Openness is not that. Openness is like the arrow of our aims points towards the outside. So you want to be open, exposed to reality. And that needs to be like the reality beyond the body-mind, meaning that you let go of me, you let go of my values. Again, you have, to you have first to become aware of your values, the, the, the shaping reality values you have, and then you, can, you should let them go emptying the self, all this goes in the same re direction of letting go of a certain orientation that creates things of attachment and of desire, but the arrow must stay open. So by rousing the whole body mind to perceive forms, rousing the whole body mind to listen to sounds, they are intimately apprehended. To study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be verified by the myriad things of the world. Okay, so that's, of course, like the, the opposite to what we were doing when we were carrying ourselves towards the myriad things. Uh, 
openness, yes, openness, which is also the, the point that makes it possible that this practice is enlightenment. So Zazen is always striving to make a Buddha, and Zazen is invariably that striving which is itself making a Buddha. Tolini talks about intenzione non intenzionale. So you are direct, you, are, you have an intention, but it is not, it doesn't have object at the end of the story. So striving to make a Buddha is the effort to keep aiming at reality, which is a never concluded practice, because reality is every second is new and unique, and so we must stay open. So it's a never ending task. Um, yes, so then there is a question, and this is more a question I want to think about later, later when I'm grown up or something like that. But I, maybe, I mean, I can get some suggestion for, from a real expert over there. So this, this question about ethics. Because, okay, we read about, now I, I will not talk too much about Plato, but like about Dogen, self-cultivation elevates eth ethics by transforming libido into wisdom. That's one way of putting that again, this e aiming that becomes wisdom. Or wisdom is aiming without grasping at bodies and, and, and objects, openness to what is real. Eros for beauty and goodness will say, stay, but not for an individual boy, but rather for what is real, the form of the virtues it manifests. That's something I still didn't say yet, but of course, this you know, platonic love. So we are still directed toward this other person, but then suddenly we don't see this person as an individual, but we see this person as manifesting a certain virtue. So I still love this guy, but because he's a manifestation of justice, right? So actually I love the justice that he manifests. Okay, so, uh, okay, then about uh, Dogen, and that is what uh, Rainer writes, orient oneself and one's action wholly towards the world, feeling responsible for every other being rather than oneself. And now the question for me comes, right? So you are open and suddenly you feel responsible? So you are, you are over there and suddenly you, you become directed towards the good? I mean, how does that, that happen? Is that magic or something? So is it enough to empty the self, to open oneself, aiming towards what is real, forms of virtues, myriad of dharma, and act according to what is real to call it ethics? Or, so what is good about that? <coughs> We also know that, I mean, I, well, I, I, I don't, don't deal with that here, but that Dogen was kind of um, angry and in disagreement with Taoism when, with, with the idea of uh, Ziran, like spontaneously so. So, you know, guys, I mean, you just think that things just happen, but everything you do makes things happen in a certain way, so don't be blind to causation. So how, how, do we, how do we reconcile this with, with the question like, is it enough to just be open, to be directed towards some kind of good? And the question is also, if you don't essentialize any good as a direction, as a form, what makes this openness uh, ethical? So this, this question is still there, and, and the question is also, well, maybe some of you remember Linklater's Waking Life, and, and, and there is this, this girl who bumps into the boy when, when they go to the, in, to the subway, and she says, sorry, 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 can we do this again? Because I would really like a real human moment. I want a real human encounter. I don't want just scripts, like sorry, or plastic, or, 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 or paper, or credit, or debit. So she wants the real human moment. That could be something that, that points in the direction of calling this openness ethics. Let's see how does that go. So this is the, the um, quote we already saw. This, the moment of present is a gate opening. To affirm the Buddha nature as the miscellaneous circumstances manifest before us is to command the style of behavior which is free of entrances. Right, so we, we experience the reality as it is in the present without constancy. We are open to whatever happens. We don't have a preferred outcome. We respond freely and creatively to the miscellaneous circumstances manifest before us. And the question is, is this ethics? Where does the direction towards the good come from? And if you will look at the Shrakumakusa uh, fascicle, there <coughs> Dogen seems to say, and then I really, well, I'm really curious about what you guys say, think, that one should uh, do good and refrain, refrain from uh, doing evil, so this Buddhist precept, let's say, means self-cultivation as continuous emptying oneself. 
So if you just stay there, the committing wrong does not happen. So it's not a committing wrong according to some violation of some code <laughs> we're discussing with Ray. It's like if you just, if you are completely open, if you are, if you ditch this dualism between self and wrong, uh, sorry, self and world, then the wrong does not happen. Then the, this, this attuned behavior will always be in the direction of alleviating suffering. If there is suffering in front of you, if there is no suffering, it will be attuned in another way. So it is the, 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 bound, the creation of the boundary between self and world that makes something become wrong. If you don't have that boundary, then what happens is committing good. Even if there is no good that essentialized that would describe all this series of action that would result from such an opening up. So, self-cultivation, emptying oneself, overcoming the dualism between self and the world, this is something that will result in continuously finding creative and virtuosic way to alleviate this ever-changing, unique suffering in front of me. The suffering is always different, is always unique, it's just like conventionally that we can label suffering as suffering or good as good. So there is just an attuned reaction, but this attuned reaction will go towards the direction that we conventionally will call alleviating suffering. So yes, ethics, because by overcoming the dualism, alleviating suffering results from this continuously creatively aiming, aiming outside of ourselves. Um, okay, for, for, uh, for Plato, I already ex uh, explained what I thought that this reorientation of, of our eros would end up with. So it's like manifesting real goodness and real virtue. And then, indeed, how, when, because, well, I, I, I already anticipated that before, but the point is that this justice or this beauty that we have known needs to be manifested in the city here and in always new and creative ways. So this is an aspect of, that, of Plato that you don't often talk about, but uh, it's interestingly, interestingly, Eros is called the betweenness between mortals and immortals. So, Aidagara, right? So that's, uh, that's what uh, Eros is. So it's not that Plato says, choose the divine and stay there. No, look at the divine, understand the real forms, but then reconnect them and uh, implement them, manifest them here in the city. So Eros is something between a mortal and immortal, occupying this middle position. He plays a vital role in holding the world together. Eros is creative taking after his father, resource, Poros. He's brave, enterprising, and determined, a marvelous huntsman, always intriguing. So, Eros is always trying to, while aiming, while having eternal beauty in mind, to manifest it here. So, reoriented Eros is creative, striving, continuously aiming towards eternal beauty, while admiring our mortal beloved, and manifesting eternal courage or justice in our temporary situated actions that make this a better city, manifesting more beauty, courage, and justice than it did before we acted, right? So this intermediate function, this manifesting it here in an always changing reality. So the idea is if we reorient our eros, we will manifest what is eternal in this ever-changing reality, and we need to keep doing that because uh, otherwise we will just have known this virtue, but our city will not become better. And if we, I mean, this, you could say, what a strange interpretation of Plato. Well, not really, right? I mean, he wrote the Republic and he's the guy who wanted to try to change Athens for the best. So he's not just like an epistemologist. Okay. Uh, so our conclusions. So what is, what are, what is Dogen and Plato's common suggestion? We are interrelated with the rest of reality in continuous change and always aiming towards what we deem good. Thus, insight into the myriad dharmas or the plurality of forms is not enough. In fact, we can transform ourselves and the world. To do so, we need awareness and reorientation of our aims. We need openness and creativity to be continuously aiming towards outside of ourselves, not towards object, but towards what is real which we will never possess and has value. 
opening ourselves to the always new situation that elicits a creative and attuned response from us. And then the question, is this ethics? Is this leading to anything we might recognize as good? Well, might we accept, because at the end we wanted you know, to have tools from them, right? So might we accept the suggestion that whatever metaphysics we hold, aiming towards the good must start with aiming outside of our narrow sphere of interest, continuously paying attention to reality, not as a sum of objects we want to possess or avoid, but as unique situations, calling for our attuned, unique, creative response. Is that a good suggestion? I think so. So might virtues, what we call virtues, be culture, culturally tinged categories attempting to codify types of attuned behavior? So might the good or the ethical behavior be the meta-category including them all? So in this case, there are only unique responses and conventional categories and our need to stay open and continuously try to find that attuned, unique response. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm quite sure there is going to have many questions about this talk, so I'll uh, keep the talk directly to the floor. Great, great. Thank you for this, for this question. That, 
makes it possible for me to say, of course, something more about Plato, right? <laughs> about Dog and I. Um, we, we, we might have this idea of Plato's forms as what is behind every thing, like, as if you would have the idea of a cat behind the cat or something. Uh, but this is, I think that is really not the right understanding of Plato. And if you look, so that's why I had this only this citation of the sophist about the interweaving of forms. So at the end, if you look at the rabbit, the rabbit or the cat, the rabbit might have the idea of rabbit, but it, it is actually an interweaving of friendliness, furriness, uh, cuteness, uh, you know, whatever. And you could also have the animalness and all the other thing. So the important, that, that is really something that allows for a, a comparison with, uh, with Pratitya Samutpada. Because the forms, it's not, I really not, okay, there is a way in which reality is carved and the reality is carved according to forms that manifest the good. And if there is something bad, it's just like a lack of that form. But it's really not that we have a chair in the form of a chair and that kind of thing. So that is not Plato's uh, ultimate reasoning about what forms are. And if you look at the Parmenides, you will see that really there is this kind of nice um, um, theater play in which Socrates is really put to shame by Parmenides because he says, Socrates, have you thought about what forms are? Uh, mm, yes, I think. Uh, that, uh, okay, what is the form of they? Uh, maybe it's like kind of a sail that is, oh no, it's maybe like a thing. So it's like a parody to show that Socrates, like let's say Plato himself in the first dialogue, didn't really think about the uh, metaphysical, the, the ontological status of the forms. It was more just about talking about virtues. But when he start to thinking about that, forms are really like what is, what is manifested in reality, which also creates a different kind of dualism than the one we usually associate with Plato. So you can see it as a dualism, but you can also see this reality is what manifests the realities that really are. So when I look at the rabbit, Conventionally, I see a distinguished object with some boundary, but actually I see a manifestation of forms. So at the end, I am also, let's forget the rabbit, let's go to me, I am or you, we are a manifestation of forms, and that is, we are shifting manifestation of different kind of forms. And that is the Plato I'm interested in, because then there is this shift in which when you look at everyday reality and you see forms, well, that is an attitude that could resemble this attitude in which you look at samsara and you see nirvana. So you look at the normal scenery you are on the market, but instead of seeing this little object of possessions, you start seeing interlacing of dharmas, and then you can let go. Yeah, so there I see the point of contact of the redefinition. But it's super interesting, and I, I, I hope you can then give me the reference about the Busho as this enveloping, because that, that, yeah, that, that would really create new horizons for research. So thank you so much. I was just wondering, I mean, transformation says yes, but I, according to my understanding, um, the notion of self involved in both these accounts seems to be very different. Um, uh, from my understanding of this philosophy and Plato. So I was wondering how you're relating both those notions together. Self-transformation, yes, but what is happening in both the accounts, the understanding of self is different. So when you are doing this whole exercise, I, mean, I would also like to see this other bit about what is then being transformed. Right, right. In both the accounts, because that seems to be... Right, right, right. Different. So, yeah, yeah. So, thanks, thanks. That, that's good because that, that's really nice because then it allows me to go back, like, to the first part when I was talking about interrelatedness, right? So, self-transformation, if self and the world would be two different zones, then it would just be that I cultivate myself on the top of the mountain and good for me, but that's nothing about the world. But... Since I am part of this reality, then while I manifest a certain, so now let's talk about Plato, when I manifest a certain virtue in a certain city or in a certain community, then this city has now a, a bigger, a larger manifestation of that virtue than it had before. 
So let's say at the level, if you would say, okay, at the level of the eternal virtues, well, that doesn't change a thing, right? They are eternal, there is no change. But now we are here in this community, and let's say that we too talk about um, the relational knower, and then we, 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 you know, we have this virtue of relationality that it is talked about, and hopefully we manifest it more. What happens? This community is now changed by our behavior according to a form. If I am in Athens and I'm, Athens and I'm talking about courage, and then something happens, and we have discussed courage so much, and we have show, I've shown courage by example, then you have all these students, these young people who now are ready to manifest courage. So it's when I, this idea that by Plato is really that knowledge is transformative, is really also in the Protagoras, there are other quotes I, I couldn't refer to, <coughs> When you really know something, you will behave accordingly to that. If you don't, it's because you don't really know it. So if you know courage, you will be brave. That changes the city because it will be a behavior. It will be, I produce not images of virtue like a poem, but the real thing. I will produce deeds according to that. If in this community, after these dialogues we are having, there is more manifestation of courage. I've transformed the world. I haven't just transformed myself. Yeah? And, well, yes, okay. And, and for Dogen, maybe someone else can. But, I mean, I, I think it's really, really, really similar idea there. If you, if you, uh, if you manifest if you, with a certain openness, it's maybe like... Now I was thinking about the, the ten ox, uh, herding pictures. I mean, it's not Dogen, but he refers also to... It's like the, the last one, you go to the market, right? You go to the market with empty hands kind of idea. And there, just the Bodhisattva, by being on the market in, on, in a certain way, will change the market. And that is why I think it's so important for Dogen to say that it is, it is really bad to say that the enlightened being is, is beyond karma, like it's beyond cause and effect, sorry, is beyond cause and effect. That would really be bad if only people who are not enlightened yet would just create changes in the world. Whereas when the person is enlightened, is completely attuned, has a completely attuned behavior with reality, if that one would not change reality, that would really be a pity, right? So it's important to see that there is continuity with reality, with and, and the attuned reaction and response of of of, of the of the bodhisattva is something that has like ripples in reality, of course. I don't know if this answers. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. yeah, I would like to um, pose a question regarding the difference between ethics and the good. Mm -hmm. How Thanks. how do you? make a distinction between this and between ethics and ethos. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because ethics, if you ask whether there is an ethics, it's already a perspective which comes from a quite fixed notion of ethics. It, perhaps it's more ethos, ethos, eth ethos, and the good is also something different, I think. It's, it's a practice more. And just one footnote to that, the first book of Nishida was the study of the good, of, of good. Mm -hmm. And he was very much um, interested in that. And um, then I would like to ask whether in, you, you think that in Plato, in Plato um, the dimension of bodily action itself is a way of uh, of knowing or of of, of becoming aware of reality, hmm. or only the knowing, the act of knowing, perhaps hmm. in uh, the, 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 uh, the distinction between, I think in Alkibia there's one, between epimelea tes psyches mm -hmm. and knotisei auton, mm -hmm. and hmm. you have the epimelea dimension, which is, is quite important also in the, in the state, in the, uh, <coughs> uh, but there is a tendency to the knowing, to mm -hmm. the say mm -hmm. Good. to know nice. the, the most, the, the idea the, <coughs> of the good. Yeah. And yeah. so I think there are some differences between also Dogen and, and Plato, yeah. because Dogen would, would st stress the bodily practice itself. <laughs> and that's a dimension of awakening, yeah. and not only thinking. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is also quite perhaps different between part of but yeah, like great, to... great. No, thank you, thank you. So, well, yeah, so I will go one by one. But the point is, look, I don't want to, as I told you at the beginning, I don't want to sweep under the carpet any differences. Yeah, yeah. It's more like this reorientation towards towards what is real mm -hmm. is something that I found in both, and also this aiming and this striving. And so that is what I wanted to concentrate. But of course, it's super interesting to talk about the differences because that yeah. we make we become sharper about what they really mean. So yes, let's absolutely go into that. So you started about ethics and the good. So this is more something that I added because in a way I think I have like there is this answer that really dividing uh, that that w when you talk about like about the dog and many people talk about it's not really ethics also this this article I, I was uh, quoting by uh, by Gideon Kopp is, is something more like it's, it's bigger than ethics and it's uh, I don't know what was the name like mega ethics or I don't know what and uh, and then other other questions like okay but there is no idea of the good so can we really call it and why does Dogen never say okay but all this reorientation is the good or something is he like um, another question I, I have is when he says you have to cast off the, the, the body-mind and so you become aware of your values, the values that shape reality, and then you let them go. Does he want us to become valueless or like secretly he wants us to steer towards some kind of good which is, for instance, alleviating suffering? Because then the question would be, what is then the, because he makes in Zazen Shin this difference between sitting and sitting in a silly way, just like sitting and you know forgetting, uh, like 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 sitting and, sit. and I was thinking about the differences about like mindfulness as it is taught to the army, right, in order to be more sharp when fighting, and a mindfulness taught in a Buddhist context. Because so, what makes the one mindfulness different from the other? And it's something that uh, it's, I mean, I, I feel that there is something to that. I want to hear from you guys how you usually explain that. So is, this is like a, a, something I, I want to look into. Uh, so th that said, it's, it, I, I still don't know. I, I still don't know. So like this direction, which is not directionless, like the mindfulness for the army, where does it come from? Is it really enough to, to drop, to ditch the, 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 the boundary between self and the world and you suddenly alleviate suffering? Or is it not enough? So that is what I want to, to, to look at. So I don't have one definition of ethics that I want to use instead of another. I don't know. I, I want to investigate that. Yes? I one word to that. Yeah. Um, there is in, in Sanskrit the, the word shunyata karuna garba. Mm -hmm. the, Emptiness is the womb of um, what is compassion. of compassion. Yeah. Of compassion. So it's totally interconnected yeah. from early Buddhism on yeah. that the experience or the practice yeah. of Shunyata is the practice also of yeah. compassion. And I think that's also a dimension which we don't find so much as a as a as a dimension of awakening the feelings. To, to feel with the uh, sentient beings, mm -hmm. with all the beings, to be in, uh, in touch with them, in concrete touch with them. And this is a, it's in, in, in Japanese also a jihi. It's, it's a, a, a way of com bodily compassion. Great. You find it in, in ancient Chinese, uh, in, in the Mencius, in Mengzi. It's this kind of, of, of idea that I immediately react if somebody is suffering. And if you do this practice, then you will react to that suffering immediately. Yeah. Yeah. And not only human beings, but also animals and plants. You will see, you will feel, you sense the yeah. suffering. Yeah. And these dimensions are all included. Yeah. And this is not an ethics uh, based on principles. Yes. But on concrete actions, and so it's, it's a question whether we can call it an ethics or not. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. I think it's a very interesting theme, this one, so I'm super interested in all the references that you can give me. Uh, about, so the, the, the second point about the bodily action, I think that, of course, there is a big difference. There is never an idea of an exercise as bodily itself, but 
the dialogue, like the real presence between two people, like that they are really there, that is very much stressed by Plato. So all these things about books are dead, they cannot answer you. So you really need some kind of uh, teacher or someone who can uh, master upaya almost, right? So you have, he has to uh, respond to whatever question the, the student has. So it's like, it's not body in the sort of bodily exercise, but bodily practice, bodily presence, let's say. So the, the bodily presence is important because no uh, student will ask the same question of another one, and only in dialogue you can really go, go and then get to, to knowledge. But, you are right, is instrumental to get this knowledge. Because when you have that, ha, ah, then, then, in terms of knowledge, you are done, but then you have to go back out of the cave, right? You have to go back in the city and manifest it. So, again, there is it's a completely different uh, uh, yeah, mechanism, but you need the presence at the beginning, then you need to get to the knowledge, and then you go back to the city. So, the, the presence is there, but the bodily exercises, I, I, I don't see that. I don't think so. Uh, yes, well, there is also something else that could be said, but uh, let's keep it for lunch. And, but you had another question, but okay, let's all skip it for lunch. Yes. Yeah, so I now, so yes, thank okay, you very okay. Much for your talk. Thank you for the question. Yeah, thank uh, you so much. <laughs>